So we left off on verse one. So verse two says, in similar fashion, the brave bodhisattvas remain in the jungle of worldly concern. No matter how joyful this world's pleasure gardens, these brave ones are never attracted to pleasures, but thrive in the jungle of suffering and pain. So the footnote from Geshe Nawan Darge says, bodhisattvas or brave ones, the spiritual offspring of the Buddhas, are those beings who have the enlightening attitude bodhicitta to work for the attainment of Buddhahood, that is enlightenment, for the sake of all sentient beings. So when we're looking at this peacock analogy and uh, the things that we've talked about so far with the wheel, yama and yamantaka, um, and just the whole premise of mind training, thought transformation, how are you going so far? Are there things that you wanna really clarify or things you wanna dive more deeply into? What's coming up? You know, following um, purification practice, you know, like any purification practice, there's always that comment that all the, everything's gone, it's all cleansed. And I keep thinking, no, it's not. I should die. <laughs> yeah, I should die. <laughs> Let me just die now. You know, that would be so good. But then I re then it came up, you know, so uh, it came up last session, you know, it's the imprints that are left. Well, yeah, it, it, it's, um, it's again like Tonglen where it's a mental attitude. Like, yeah. you know, you haven't purified all your karma from beginning yeah. of time, mm -hmm. but you're saying I've purified all my karma from beginning of yeah. time. And then you're like, no, I yeah. haven't. Yes, I have. Think that I have, but I know I haven't. And you kind of, you know, <laughs> glint. Yeah. <laughs> right. Mm. And it's, it's like Tonglen where by adopting the mental attitude, you get closer to being to that point. And right. Time also is lacking inherent existence, just like everything else. So in the relative world, time mm. is linear, one, two, three, four, tick, ticking seconds going by. But in terms of ultimate truth, it's not so, it's just not so concrete as that. So in the future, mm. you will be free of all negative karma. And it's actually these things of thinking I'm all already purified or I'm taking the suffering of all sentient beings. These are sutra ideas that are moving you towards tantra ideas also, mm, right? right? Where you're taking the yeah. result as the path. Yes. So I think a, a big part of our blockages mm. is not being able to project a future where things are better. Yeah. And a lot of even just basic psychology, like if someone is in a really bad way, you ask them, what are things you would look forward to or what are things that you would like to happen or what's your best case scenario or you know these things that help people widen the focus get more perspective think in terms of the long view all of that kind of stuff frees up the tight narrow focus of self-cherishing which gets obsessed with the little piddly happinesses and comforts of one day so by thinking I've purified all negativity from beginningless time, you're opening up the possibility and the truth of that being possible. Mm. So you yeah. adopt that attitude and for a moment, try to feel that it's true, hold open the truth of the possibility of it and the fact that you're moving towards it in this very moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, you know, and then you go back to your life and you know, there's much to be purified. And it's really once you realize emptiness directly, you're taking a blowtorch to those seeds. Still the adopting these mental attitudes without getting weird with it does make it quicker to be true. Right. Yeah. So it's a preparation. Yeah. It's a preparation, mm -hmm. but it's like, it's a needed preparation. It's, yeah. it's not yeah. a fairy tale and it's not lying, no. it's projecting a future, which will be true. Yes, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, other, yeah, other thoughts? And, you know, karma is tricky, isn't it? Because intellectually, not so hard to get your head around, but to perceive it directly in all of its layers and nuances, you actually have to be a Buddha. It's more subtle than understanding the emptiness of inherent existence. Emptiness of inherent existence is a subtle phenomena karma is an extremely subtle phenomenon. Yeah, so 
on the surface, we can see the manifest things ripening and make an educated guess because we know things are of a similar type. So if you're getting a lot of criticism, you know you've done a lot of criticism. It's going to be a similar type, like an apple seed leads to an apple tree. But to know all of the details and nuances of one cause leading to one effect, it's not so simple mm. as that. So there's also mm. that piece with karma, which makes things harder. Yeah, Judy, okay. go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Eleanor. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Ben Young Ten. A few, just a few thoughts as I'm trying to kind of <laughs> make more, more crystallize. Um, um, just thinking about Yam and Taka, Yama being the Lord of Death or the Lord of Karma, and the Taka aspect being the Slayer of the Lord of Death. So obviously, um, you know, there is some sort of reincarnation, I'm sure, some sort of continuity of aspects of consciousness. So, but ultimately, we are, we are all going to die, and we're all going to die again and again, most probably. So it's to do with identification. So it's to do, to do with identification with eternity and with the infinity of beings. So in our life right now, the benefits will just continue. And for that, we need to slay the um, self-cherishing mind, this sort of selfishness. But it's not as though, you know, we are going to be born and die and born and die. And to me, that can't be seen as a punishment. And obviously, as a bodhisattva, choose to be born anyway. And to me, that also relates to the idea of like kind of serving God, wanting your life to be of service, serving the bigger picture, not serving selfishness. And I think that really relate, those two really relate. And for me, always it's been to do with that really, not so much of wanting to get out of suffering. I don't want to suffer, I'm suffering enough, thank you very much. But actually, the real yearning has been wanting to be a service, you know, wanting to serve God or wanting to serve, be a bodhisattva in Buddhist terms. And I also think the text for me personally, I'm very happy to apply it to myself as a mind training. I wouldn't take it on as, as a universal, as, as a definite truth, but it's kind of like, it feels like it works. But as you rightly said, I, didn't, I could never apply it to thinking about the human condition, about other people, about animals, you know, their suffering. Because I'm concerned as a human being with this unlimited potential, we need to do whatever we can to alleviate suffering of others. And as far as I'm concerned, that's enough. And I don't know, you know, I don't know what's caused atrocities within the human condition and the way the atrocious who treat animals. And it's not, as far as I'm concerned, it's never their fault. It was never their fault in past lives either. I won't take that on, I refuse to. Because uh, it doesn't help me, it, it doesn't help me to feel the compassion that I would need to take action. Yeah. 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 It sounds like you know yourself, right? It sounds like you know yourself and your worldview and your belief system. And, you know, like we say all the time, you don't need to be Buddhist to practice Buddhism and you can take the parts of Buddhism that resonate and put to one side the pieces that don't resonate. The words we okay, don't- I'm sorry, I'm a Buddhist actually, but I am a Buddhist, but I'm quite influenced by other things as well. Well, it, it's fine however you wanna identify, you know, it's, it's your life. Um, it's just that we would never use the word punishment right? Yeah. Karma is not punishing you or rewarding you. And there's not a paternal godlike divine figure bestowing boons or bestowing grief. We're talking about natural cause and result. And the issue that we're talking about is that from beginningless time, we've had this beautiful Buddha nature, which is our ability for the mind to transform. And as you say, these acts of service and connection and all of this wonderful stuff, We've always had the potential for that. We will always have the potential for that until it's actualized into the perfected enlightened state, right? But we've also always had innate ignorance, which is why we hurt ourselves and we hurt other people. Always we've had innate ignorance, but we won't always have it. We will destroy the innate ignorance. So the Buddha nature can't be destroyed. It can only be transformed into enlightenment. The ignorance can be destroyed. Yeah, and the negative karma can be destroyed. And I guess if you wanna just kind of like completely objectively, not thinking about your own life necessarily, just as a thought experiment, what does it do to think that all bad behavior comes from ignorance and suffering? I mean, that's basic psychology, whether you believe in past and future lives or not, right? Is there any bad behavior that doesn't come from ignorance or suffering or both? And you say at first, usually people say, oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, ignorance or suffering, that's what makes bad behavior. Yep, yep. And then you think, but what about very smart, calculated serial killers who do things on purpose, 
what about the ones who enjoy it? They're not suffering, they're really smart. They don't have ignorance, they're not in pain. No, we're talking about something much subtler. The ignorance we're talking about is the illusion of separateness which is not to say that we're all one big glob, we're not. We're all distinctive mental continuums changing moment to moment, but so interconnected and so mutually influencing that the distinctions we feel are not the distinctions that are there. However, we feel those distinctions, we reinforce that dualism and we create negative karma as a result of that view. So when bad things happen, it is not your fault and you do not deserve it, but you did create the cause in a past moment of ignorant behavior. And it might've been a thousand lifetimes ago and you would never do the same thing. But for us, it doesn't sit well to think, how could something like war or child abuse or rape or famine or floods have anything to do with the poor suffering people who are experiencing that pain? It's simply not fair. It's not justice. It has to be nature or random. It can't be from us. But then you think, oh, then maybe it's from God. But of course, Buddhists don't believe in a creator God. We believe in divine beings, but not a creator God. Karma is what creates the world from our perspective. So it doesn't sit right, right? Like you think this poor little baby having a terrible parent who abuses them, they don't deserve that. No, they don't deserve that. But they did create the cause for that in a previous life, maybe a zillion lifetimes ago. And that actually is more empowering than to think that it's random or that they're a victim because it means it doesn't have to happen again once they meet a path. Now, you don't have to take on that worldview. It's completely up to you but just kind of sitting with, here's how and why we think that way, that all results have causes of a similar type, but also karma expands. So if you don't purify a negative karma, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, but a positive karma also gets bigger and bigger and bigger, that's great news. So how do you think about things that you would never do, right? Like say you would never hurt a child or you would never hurt an animal. Is there something that you could relate to as a tiny micro version that you could see yourself doing that then expanded? So I always like the example of how we treat our pets that we love. Sometimes people with pets that they love are completely oblivious to the bodily autonomy of that being. And they'll pick up the whole body of that animal and squish them and cuddle them and kiss them all over and love bomb the animal and be like, oh, I love you so much. And the animal is actually like, dude, let me go. You're freaking me out. Yeah, and we kind of don't care because we trust our good intentions. We think, well, I love you. You should know that. But the animal is actually like, I'm a little scared. I'm trapped. I want you to put me down. Now, that is a tiny, tiny, fairly benign seed of a similar type that could expand into something as terrible as objectifying and using someone's body for your own power and control and sexual needs, right? So it's a continuum. And it actually helps us to understand how we are capable of anything terrible and wonderful because then we don't feel like evil people or amazing people are some separate species of human. We just see that they've had different lives and different conditions. If we'd had those lives and those conditions, we would wind up similarly. Right. It stops pride, it stops alienation, it stops all sorts of things to realize we're all capable of anything. Let's actively engage in the positive, the potentiality and the kind. Does that, does that help a little bit, just kind of say? Well, yeah, that, it, 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 help, help, it helps a lot. I think I've just heard some of these types of people fly in ways that are not helpful. Yeah, yeah, and we have to be so delicate with talking about karma, and it's another one where, you know, don't tell your friend with cancer about karma. Tell yeah. yourself with cancer about karma, you know? And only if you've already told yourself about it in the past, thought about it, digested it, come to an understanding where, you can feel happy to exhaust old negative karma, not like you're being punished for being bad, because that's not yeah. the way it is, you know. I think my thinking is that, I mean, this stuff may well be true. I, 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 could, I could never possibly know my limited brain, but 
but I think I could, it may well be true, but still, I think our role is to try to alleviate suffering by working on ourselves and doing what we can to alleviate yeah. suffering out yeah, there. Whatever the causes are, I, I can accept that may well be the case, but I could never, I'm not, I'm not capable of actually knowing that's true, but I can accept you know that it. Is. Yeah, you know that being service is going to be a good thing. And if you remember the lack of inherent ex existence, then you won't overly identify with yourself as being a person of service and get an inflated ego about being a helper, <laughs> right? And when you are when you fail or you're not as helpful as you thought you were, you will remember dependent arising and the fact that you don't have control over all of the conditions. So, you know, so you can use some of these ideas kind of playfully and experimentally, even within the framework of one life and just kind of see how it goes over time. Yeah, so just, uh, yeah. I, think, I think that can be an ego trip as well. I can't it wanted to be a good being seen as a good person. I've, I've known that from the past. I think I've probably did that one now. Yeah, yeah, thank goodness. That, <laughs> that's I love it. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Thank you so much, it's really helpful. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, thank, thanks for your question, Judy. Is there, are there other kind of hanging thoughts before we do a bit more about peacocks and poison? And then we'll do a little meditation. All right, so I think a very beautiful word in this verse is thrive, okay? So it doesn't mean that they are bearing the suffering and having no joy in their life. They're actually bearing the suffering and it makes them even happier. Yeah, so this is something to aspire to even though we're not there yet. And to know that this is the possibility of a human consciousness to frame things in this way. So. The poison is samsara and the poison in its literal form before we go into the poetry of what it represents um, is said to be aconite or wolfsbane, I think sometimes called monkshood. I don't know, I'm not a botanist, but the specific poison is this aconite, which in traditional Indian medicine was used in tiny, tiny quantities to make people well, but in too much quantities was poison and would kill them. So. This is analogous to the danger of living in a samsaric environment, utilizing samsaric pleasures without having renunciation and bodhicitta. It's also analogous to the danger of afflictions in general and the challenges of suffering. So aconite, though poisonous, used in small amounts can be medicine. Samsara used skillfully can help us get out of samsara. Okay, so this is an interesting thing to sit with. It's not like samsara is anything other than you in your own mind per se, right? Samsara is your five contaminated aggregates, appropriated aggregates, right? Under the influence of karma and disturbing emotions. The five aggregates are samsara. The samsaric environment is a projection of that. So heaven and hell live in the same place, right? How you, how you perceive it is the truth for you. The Buddha can see all of it simultaneously, but for us, we just have to live with the projections of our own karma and say, what do I do with this? How do I use this poison as medicine? How do I use it in a way that is pacing it practically? That's the correct dosage for my level. Yeah. So like some happiness, samsaric happiness, external supports like housing and food and friendship and meaningful work are not happiness in and of themselves, but we do need them at our level for forward motion, for progress. Yeah, we need food, clothing, housing, meaningful friendships, meaningful work, even if that work isn't like, uh, you know, paid work or whatever, you, you know, you need something productive to do in your life, but productive in the sense of connecting with humanity or animals or whatever. Okay, so the attached mind then says, yes, but more, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, I have a house, but I need a bigger house or I need to renovate the house. Are people judging my house? Look at how splendid my house. It becomes a whole story of the house rather than I have a house. Good, that helps. Yeah. And the food is, you know, I need different food and I, oh, I ate that yesterday and I need more and I need sweeter and I need saltier and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And it needs to be, you know, grass fed, fair trade, no GMO, et cetera, ne nectar, bespoke, whatever, heirloom, tomatoes, something, all the words, right? All the hippie words. And then it will be happiness and then I will be faultless in my consumption. Untrue, <laughs> right? 
there is no form of consumption that doesn't involve hardship to other sentient beings. So you're kind of making peace with everything you do and use from a samsaric place is going to have a problematic aspect. So you try and minimize consumption, but then what you consume, you enjoy and practice contentment and gratitude with. Yeah, you enjoy it though. You enjoy it. You don't think I'm not allowed to enjoy it because it's not pure. That is useless and not worthwhile. You think, I need to consume things in order to continue to sustain life at my level. Later, when I'm a being of light, I will not need food, but right now I do, <laughs> right? So you eat it with such a way that is just filled with gratitude, connection, enjoying the flavors, enjoying the process, and just be with it, and then be done, and be content, and don't let the whole project of your day be anticipating the dinner you'll cook, you know? Unless, your practice is, my life's work and my service is offering food to the people I love or offering food as part of my work. And then I will make that my practice with intention. So again and again, it's like there's the activity, but there's the mentality you bring to the activity, which is much more important. So you could be working at a Dharma center, facilitating Dharma programming and bringing in all sorts of good teachers and bringing in all the students and doing everything good but you're grumpy and resentful the whole time, not really Dharma work, just admin, <laughs> right? Or you could be doing something really menial like cleaning out the sewers, but you do it with this mentality of service and it's like bodhisattva work. So what it looks like is not the point where you're coming from is the point. When you're using the poison of samsara, it really is helpful to think of samsaric pleasures as poison, but the ones that could be made into medicine if you use in the right dosage. Just like wolfsbane, apparently, right? Not a botanist, nobody eat wolfsbane. I'm not sure what it'll do, but anyway. Right? So little titrating amounts, which is really um, approaching your consumption differently and approaching it in a way that you're consciously staying out of contact with things that you know you're not ready for, okay? So for example, if you are an alcoholic, you don't go to a bar, it's not the bar's fault that there's alcohol in it. You know, you have a problematic relationship with that substance, so you stay out of where that substance lives without blaming the pub or the bar, right? Similarly with us, we have to know what is the amount of samsara that I can take on the path, and what is so much that it's just going to inflame my attachment? So the samsaric poison is going to be very different in terms of how much is too much for you to take on the path. But the very important thing is to have the self-awareness that doesn't lie to yourself. So what you're just sitting with, with all of this, how do I use poison in the right amount at the right time, is to just be so fiercely honest with compassion. Self-awareness is the key to your transformation. So you cannot lie to yourself or it won't work. Yeah, and if you do a little dance of justification, know that, yeah? With food, we do it all the time. Oh, I'm just gonna have a little bit and then you have all of it. Yeah, know that you're lying to yourself at least, even if you eat the whole packet of biscuits and you planned on only eating two, know that you're lying to yourself to at least start to break the spell, yeah? Does it make sense, yeah, the way in which to use samsara? And I mean, even more difficult than attachment sometimes is anger because it feels justified. Yeah, and so how do you use the fact of anger arising on the path? Before you're doing anything with tantra, you can think, knowing my anger well, I can see the way it leads to harm, the way it harms relationships, the way it steals my peace, the way it steals my health, the way that it hurts in such a ripple effect all the relationships around me. So I'm going to use the samsaric anger that's arising in such a way that I help un myself understand people. So that when I see an angry person, I have immediate compassion for them because I know the pain of it. And I have patience with them because I know how much anger loves to justify itself. Yeah, do you know what I mean? So you're using all the things that arise for, from you as information, but you're also 
choosing to not believe everything you say to yourself. Yeah, and to not give in to old patterns just because they're patterns, just because they're familiar. Yeah, just because it's familiar doesn't mean it's true or real or right. So all of this has to be done with the correct identification of who are you. You are a sentient being who has Buddha nature. You are what is merely labeled on the collection of parts. You are not your afflictions. You are not your negative behaviors. You are not your mistakes. All of those are temporary and removable. So if you can de-identify with them while taking responsibility for them, then you can start to meet them as the enemy that they are without it hurting yourself in the meantime. So later in the verses, it talks about trample him, trample him, stomp on the head of this dualistic conception. And it's so aggressive. But what you're being aggressive towards is your own thing, your own sort of materials of pain and causes for pain. You're not being harsh to yourself. Okay, but you can only do this if you have the right relationship and perspective on your own mistakes and your own negative mental habits. Otherwise, it feels like you're just whipping yourself saying that you're bad, and that's not it at all. Okay, so the samsaric environment is filled with temptations towards desire, temptations towards anger, temptations towards ignorance and disassociation, numbing. It's full of temptations, and so how do you organize your life so that they're manageable amounts that you can take on the path and not be lost by? This is the inner work that we have to do so that we can really be the peacock without dying from the poison, okay? So it's an interesting analogy, this peacock and poison one. And so then the bodhisattvas as peacocks, they're, there's basically peacocks are analogous to bodhisattvas in five ways. And this is in many of the commentaries, but I'm using the commentary of Geshe Nawang Darge. And this, is, this one I think you can find on the Alexander Burson website, Study Buddhism. But in any way, I'll just show you now. So just as the colors of peacock's feathers grow more radiantly beautiful when they eat plants that are poisonous to other animals, bodhisattvas shine with the blissful happiness by making use of such poisons, poisonous delusions such as desire and attachment for the benefit of others. So just as peacocks have five crown feathers, Bodhisattvas have the attainment of the five graded paths for enlightenment. So that's the five paths. So the path of accumulation, which is when you have renunciation, the determination to be free and uncontrived bodhicitta. And then you have the path of preparation, which is the union of calm abiding and special insight focused on emptiness conceptually. Then the path of seeing, calm abiding, special insight, focused on emptiness perceptually, directly. Then the path of meditation is repeating that meditation on emptiness again and, and again and again, purifying eons of negative karma until you achieve the path of no more learning, which is Buddhahood. So just as the sight of a peacock's colorful display gives us great pleasure, the sight of a bodhisattva uplifts our mind because of their bodhicitta. So I think that we've seen this, yes, maybe with some of our lamas or maybe some people in our life where just the sight of them makes you so happy, whether or not they're conventionally beautiful or not is kind of irrelevant. They walk into the room and everyone just goes, ting. yes, have you had this experience, especially with the lamas? And it's, it's remarkable, just kind of the flood of joy they bring with them. And to think that is remarkable and that is my potential too. That's who I'll be when I grow up, right? To not, not put them in the category of these are fundamentally different creatures and specimens of humanity, just as you don't wanna think serial killers and rapists and warmongers are a whole different subspecies of human. These are all potentials of a human and we can go either way. So when, you, when people come into the room with that beautiful bodhicitta and it just kind of blasts you with joy, think that is my potential and that is the work I've already begun now how wonderful it is I've met a path and how wonderful it is I've met people who seem to be practicing it who can show me. Yeah, so um, like 
peacocks, bodhisattvas, are beautiful to look at and make you happy to see them. Just as peacocks live mostly on poisonous plants and never eat insects or cause others harm, bodhisattvas never cause even the slightest harm to other sentient beings. And just as peacocks eat poisonous plants with pleasure, when bodhisattvas are offered sensory objects, Although they have no attachment to these objects, they accept them with pleasure to allow the owner to gain merit from their offering. So, you know, you can offer tea and cake and beautiful things to your friendly local geshi or to his holiness or whoever, and they'll take it for your sake, even though they don't need it or are attached to it, they'll take it for your sake. So then we get this like crows versus peacocks conversation. So verse three says, we spend our whole lives in search for enjoyment, yet tremble with fear at the mere thought of pain. Thus, since we are cowards, we are miserable still, but the brave bodhisattvas accept suffering gladly and gain from their courage a true lasting joy. So even though crows in real life, crows are very smart, crows, you know, have great community dynamics. There's also some kind of folk story issue, you know, from India and Tibet that crows um, are cowardly and they run away from any hardship very swiftly and they kind of have a deviousness to them. So whether that's true or not is really not the point. They're analogous to the coward list that happens to us when we have self-cherishing and self-grasping. So verse four says, now, desire is the jungle of poisonous plants here. Only brave ones like peacocks can thrive on such fare. If cowardly beings like crows were to try it, because they are greedy, they might lose their lives. So it's again, this thing of knowing what can you personally take on the path and what if you were to take it on the path would fail and actually lead to your demise. So the word now, this is from Geshe Nawandarge. He says, there are three levels of training the mind according to the three scopes of motivation outlined in the Lam Rim, teaching the graded course to enlightenment. So the initial scope motivation, we work with to attain a better future rebirth, right? The small scope or initial scope. The intermediate scope or middle scope, we work to attain liberation nirvana from the vicious circle of rebirth for ourselves alone. With an advanced scope or great scope, as a follower of the Mahayana path with bodhicitta motivation, we can work to attain full enlightenment of Buddhahood for the benefit of all beings. So the word now in the text indicates the importance of practicing the teachings with an advanced scope of motivation, having previously trained our minds along the Lam Rim graded course. So again, this is bodhisattva training, and it's again how if you're focusing on working for the welfare of others, it benefits you. If you're working on only benefiting yourself, yourself suffers. And it's a paradox, but not really. It's a contradiction, but not really. And when you're thinking about just your ordinary life, when you've really been wanting to work for the welfare of others, like, I don't know, you're cleaning the house before guests come, then you have a clean house. That's nice. Yes, you benefit from the clean house. You may not have made the effort except for guests were coming. Yes. So we're, you know, take very simple, easy, everyday examples like that to think about the way that working for the welfare of others benefits you. And you might actually stretch yourself and expand and do things that are a little uncomfortable at first, but then wind up widening your capacity. And then the next time you do it, there's no resistance or hardship and you get bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah, so I remember once, maybe 15 years ago, something like that, when His Holiness used to come to Australia all the time, there was one visit where he was going to all the major cities of Australia and teaching for two, three days, each place, four days, sometimes it was really magic kind of time when he used to come almost every year. And I was a little, you know, helper, you know, like, put the flowers out, you know, like, help with seating, whatever, like just little menial sort of admin helpy jobs. And so I followed his holiness for the whole tour doing little helpy jobs. And I was in my, I don't know, in my twenties then, and I was so tired. Oh my gosh. Just helping with teachings, going to teachings, helping to teachings, going to teachings. I was wasted. 
and I was in the prime of my youth. <laughs> His holiness was way older than me. And what I didn't realize until I followed him was that in between his teachings, he's having interviews with people, with magazines, with TV, with newspapers. He's helping different groups of people that are not publicized at all. He's going to hospices or he's going to see old people or he's going to see AIDS survivors or he's going to, you know, he's going all over the place helping people. He's not having breaks. I was tired with breaks and I wasn't even doing anything except for running around putting out snacks, you know? And I think this is what really shows us the way capacity can grow. That despite me being young and healthy in the prime of my youth, because I didn't have bodhicitta, I didn't have the same energy as him. But he has the energy because he's driven by bodhicitta. So, you know, when you have that, it really gives such a momentum. And you don't have that kind of friction and resistance of, I'm too tired, I don't want to, <laughs> right? You don't have that little whiny thing come up in you and how much happier you are because of not having it. So it's something to look forward to. And so with an advanced scope mot motivation, there are two ways we can follow the Mahayana path. By following the perfection vehicle or the paramitayana, it may take many lifetimes before we reach our goal of enlightenment. But by following the tantra vehicle, vajrayana, we may attain enlightenment within one human lifetime. So the word here in the text indicates the immediacy of practicing the tantra path with an especially strong bodhicitta motivation. So this is a, a perfection vehicle text, but it has references to tantra and it's pointing to tantra. So the tantra system teaches many methods for the speedy attainment of enlightenment. Included amongst them is the use as a path of the normally poisonous delusions. In order to use delusions such as lustful desire as a path, however, we must first be devoid of the self-cherishing attitude. That is the greedy attachment to our own self-interest. So in addition, we must have a sound understanding of voidness, emptiness. The fact that all things, including ourselves, lack a truly independent manner of existence. To use delusions as a path without these two requisites is extremely dangerous. And far from achieving our intended goal, we may completely destroy our chance for attaining enlightenment. When you're using afflictions, whether from a perfection vehicle perspective or a tantra vehicle perspective, you really have to have this for others, for others, for others, for others, just constant in the back of your mind. Because when things are going well, it's easy to get lost in it. Yeah, it's easy to get lost in it. So if from the very outset, <laughs> you're thinking I'm doing this for the welfare of all sentient beings, in a way it protects you from going down the wrong road. Uh, it's not about crows. I, I wanted to, um, uh, just a comment and I um, don't know if I'm right or not. Um, so I would appreciate <laughs> your, uh, just a thought and I would appreciate your commentary on that. Um, um, for in that second verse, um, there was a phrase that a bodhisattva thrives on, on, on suffering. And um, I was thinking like in life, sometimes we get so, um, so bogged in our suffering that sometimes we feel ashamed of not suffering when there is so much suffering around you know if you lost someone or some um grief we don't know how to get out of that grieving process what is the right amount of grief you know yeah. <laughs> um or if someone is sick we we just think especially for our children or, or or our parents um and i think um i was thinking when with, with that verse that it's um it like sort of gives you um, an opportunity to tell yourself that you can still thrive and be happy because if you're not, then in a way you still can't help anyone. Yeah. Um, so like it gives you, I don't know, it gives you per permission maybe, maybe it's a wrong mm -hmm. word, permission to thrive uh, among that suffering, the immediate suffering in your life, even if people in your life um are going through difficult times or things am i right to think so yeah 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think, I think we're used to kind of a kind of garden variety empathy where to be with someone in their pain, we need to show some sort of aspect of also having pain or something, or if something tragic happens in order to relate to humanity, we need to show the displays of grief that the people of our culture display or something. And it's something about relating to others that makes us feel like we have to do that, even if that's not what we're feeling. And it's not like, you know, you, you, I don't know, tell inappropriate jokes when someone's just lost their mother or something because you're feeling happy, you don't mind. It's not like that, obviously, but it is definitely the case that you can thrive and be happy within hardship. And in fact, that's a contented, calm mind that has more creativity. And when your mind is contented and calm and has more creativity, all of your life's wisdom is at your fingertips. And so the best thing to do to help someone that you know so far is acceptable for you. Like it's accessible. Does it make sense? So it's, I think it's really interesting to think about when you've been caught in a negative state of mind, but you want to help, you only have a couple of strategies or options of what might help. Yeah, but when you're calm, there's a lot of possibilities and you're much more fluid and flexible in saying, I think for this situation, this. And then if it doesn't work, you're also less distressed and agitated because again, you know, you don't have control over all the conditions. You only have control over some. So you're not punishing yourself for not being as helpful as you wanted to be. Or when you are helpful, you're not overly identifying and thinking I'm an amazing helper. You know, it's, it's just keeping you in balance. So to thrive doesn't mean you're bouncy, excited, happy. It means a deep contentment and calm. And that even when you have grief, there's some sort of baseline stability. And it might be a little bit like the way you are with a little kid who's going through a wrong time. You know, if they're going through a tough time and they have a tantrum, you don't have a tantrum with them, right? You, you're with them, you're holding the space, you're helping them calm down. If they want a hug, you give them a hug. If, you, if they want space, you give them space. And you just kind of let it roll through because you know emotions at, at that level of intensity will die a natural death if they don't get fed. So you've seen your own tantrums play out over your life. So you're not afraid of their tantrum unless you're overtired and haven't slept enough, right? So you can hold the space for them to have a fit and just gently assess the situation. But if you're agitated and angry and mad at them for having a tantrum, you're not helping them move through it. And we know this as adults who have had children in our life. So you thriving gives more conditions for them to thrive. And we can be the same with our peers or with even people that are somehow in authority above us, whatever. We can be in a leadership role, always divorced from authority. You know, that leadership and authority don't have to go together. You can kind of set the tone, even if you're not in charge. Yeah. Yeah, any, any other thoughts before we do a little meditation? <laughs> 